the Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. This is the Financial Survival Network. Financial Survival Network is presented to you by Regal Assets. Buy and sell physical gold and silver through your existing retirement plan, 100% tax-free with Regal Assets. If you want to include physical gold or silver in your existing IRA or old 401k, request your free investment kit, which was recently featured in the Forbes and Smart Money Wall Street Journal magazines. Call toll-free 855-678-6620, 855-678-6620, or visit regalassets.com. Governments want you to believe that they are in control, that they're on top of the economic situation, that you have absolutely nothing to worry about, that nothing, nothing can go wrong. Well, goldmoney.com exists because they want you to have insurance. And I've, I've got Alistair McLeod on the line, and he is head of research now at goldmoney.com. Hey, Alistair, welcome back to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. It's a great pleasure to be with you, Kerry. Likewise, we're always glad to have you because you give our somewhat parochial show in Greenwich, Connecticut, an international kind of uh, flavor and outlook. And on that note, what's going on in Europe now and, uh, and in the UK? Well, um, the Eurozone is still drifting towards the rocks uh, without any captain on board <laughs> and um, there is no solution to it. You've got bust countries uh, hoping that they get more of a bailout. You've got uh, the creditor nations like Germany, Austria, Netherlands, Finland and Luxembourg reluctant to put up any more money uh, and uh, meanwhile we're just drifting towards the rocks there. And that's very serious because you're talking about uh, a very, very large economy with a very substantial banking system uh, interlinked with everyone else's banks. And as that problem gets worse and worse and worse, we just get more and more frightened about the consequences. So that's really what's going on in, in, in Europe. In the UK, it looks like the UK economy is also drifting uh, downwards. Uh, there are worries now being expressed that the government needs to do something uh, like stimulate or spend some money, spend taxpayers' money. Uh, and so the political pressures are mounting in that sense. Um, and I suppose, really, that's the background to what we're facing over here in Europe at the moment. Yeah, that's so it's kind of like we've got uh, this train ro roaring down the tracks uh, you know a huge portion of the world's income and production takes place in the eu um you know the european uh, union more than in the u.s and kind of nobody's in control of it now if you're an anarchist you might think that's a good thing but when this thing is heading for the end and there's just a pretty much a wall of rock there to stop that train it's not going to be pretty is it no it's not and um the the problem in the eurozone has got to the point where one suspects that the politicians in germany in particular finland also uh, rather want out of having to backstop all the mediterranean nations um I had I interviewed Marcus Kerber, um, who is a professor of economics uh, in Berlin, uh, about ten days ago, uh, and he is bringing this court case against the Constitutional Court, uh, the German Constitutional Court, on September the twelfth, and he was really very interesting on the whole subject. Um, I don't think we're going to get a clear-cut resolution on September the twelfth from the court, because there is also a similar. Um, action being brought by an Irish member of parliament uh, um, in the European Court of Human Justice, sorry, the, U U the European Court of Justice uh, in, um, in Luxembourg. And that is the superior court 
uh, in constitutional terms to the German Constitutional Court. So it could well be that the German Constitutional Court just puts the judgment on one side until they hear what the result is from the Luxembourg Court. Right. Now, having said that, one thing that's interesting in this, just give you a scale of how the situation has deteriorated. Uh, the last action that was brought before the court was, um, again, for exactly the same thing, and the estimated cost to the German taxpayer was 170 billion euros. Now, that was a year ago. This time round, Professor Kerber tells me that he is submitting the cost so far to Germany is 2 trillion euros, and there's a further 1.7 trillion in the pipeline. So in one year, they have gone from 170 billion euros liability to 3.7 trillion. I mean, that's a frightening deterioration of the situation. And that is what the court is being asked to consider. On top of that, you've got a uh, um, general election in Germany next year. I think it's in the second half of next year. And so the politicians are going to be backing off rather than trying to persuade their electorate that the euro is a wonderful thing and they've got to divvy up some money out of their savings in order to keep the project going. So what we are now seeing, I think, is the backstop um, strategy, and that is the only way the euro is going to be saved is uh, a short-term kicking the can down the road with the ECB uh, ensuring that countries like Spain and Italy do not need funding, and they will do that by doing anything they can to keep the bond yields down. They will buy whatever bonds or finance the banks in those countries to buy whatever bonds the government needs to sell in order to meet their deficits. So we have got by default a money printing mechanism being set in motion there. And this is interesting because um, this has become very apparent over the last week. And I think at the same time, coming over to your side of the pond, Kerry, um, the FOMC is now showing signs that they are sort of thinking that maybe QE3 or something, some form of stimulus has got to be brought in in order to rescue the U.S. economy. Um, and so the, and the net result of that is, and it may be just coincidence, but we see gold and silver taking off. So uh, I think these are very interesting times, um, and we'll look back on it, I think, with considerable interest to see how the whole thing interlinks. Yeah, I agree with you about the part of, about interesting times, but uh, also scary times, because once you go down that road, and we've been down the road already for years, it seems, but once you start going down that road, there's nothing to stop you from printing. Uh, once you print $1, it's QE to infinity, as Jim Sinclair calls it, and, you know, and then they've held off as long as they could, so they're getting to the point where they're starting to panic, is what it appears to me. And you don't make good decisions when you're panicking, because they're not thought out. They're just, you just try to do something. And I mean, as we're speaking, you know, it's August 23rd today and gold is up 20 bucks. And when I woke up this morning, actually, when I went to bed last night, it was up $7. And I said to my friend, and we'd both been predicting a breakout probably in July. So it's a month late. Um, I said, this is the kind of day where gold could go up $100 an ounce and there's nothing that can stop it. And even silver, which has really gotten killed, it's over $30 an ounce now. So the markets, uh, if you want to read anything into them, are certainly saying that uh, all this talk of QE is great for metals prices. And that's kind of the dirty secret is that it's just further depreciation of the currency. It's the stealth tax because you can't get the Germans to vote on it. You can't get the German court to approve of it. But you just go ahead and print the stuff up anyway and let them withdraw if they don't like it. And do you really believe that they're going to do that, right? Well, um, Professor Kerber um, thinks that the sensible outcome would be for the, those, if you like, the harder currency nations, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Finland and Austria and um, Luxembourg to set up a new currency, which he calls the Gildenmark, which is a portmanteau between the Gilder and the Mark. 
um, and, and leave the others to sink or swim um, with the euro. So now that is interesting because uh, as things develop, I think more and more people are going to think that's a likely outcome. And that's going to have, I think, a pretty nasty effect on the euro, which is going to make the management of the situation from the ECB's uh, point of view very, very difficult. Because it's one thing to just print money. Um, if you can print money without undermining the currency, that is a central banker's idea of heaven. If, on the other hand, uh, you, as soon as you sort of begin to move your finger to the print switch uh, and uh, the currency starts falling, that is the central banker's nightmare. And it could well be that the ECB is going to be faced with a nightmare rather than an, any idea of ecstatic heaven. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it, it, it's turning into a very dangerous situation. And um, it's interesting that, uh, you know, our experience at gold money, uh, while uh, gold and silver were, were sort of backing off their highs of about a year ago, uh, we found that uh, people have been adding their position to their positions, and basically, we're talking about ordinary folk uh, who ha have savings, who are worried about uh, the systemic risks, which they see escalating the whole time, uh, and they just want some insurance. And uh, they take the view that you put aside 10%, 15%, and hope it's not needed. So uh, this sort of insurance element has just been building and building and building. Uh, and we, we've certainly seen these flows, if you like, from savers. And it's turning into a very dangerous situation. And we could easily see the euro go into a death slide, which um, is extremely worrying. And interestingly, there are a number of businesses, high profile businesses, uh, who have been reducing their exposure to the eurozone, uh, presumably because they're beginning to think that same way. Yeah, well, I read about that. And they're getting ready for the euro to collapse. And I guess that's just sound business. Hopefully it won't happen. But uh, if you're a CEO, if you've got wide exposure to all the countries in the EU, and you think there's any possibility that this house of cards is going to come tumbling down, then for sure, you want to be prepared, and you want a contingency plan in place. And you know what, Alistair, that contingency plan, maybe right, not right now, but it's sometime in the near future is going to contain precious metals. I got to believe it. Yes, I think that's right. But going back just slightly before we get on to precious metals, all large companies, as you know, have uh, treasury officers, people whose function it is to move uh, a multinational business's cash around and to maximize the returns, make sure the cash is there for the operating subsidiaries and so on and so forth. What they're doing now is uh, they seem to be removing their cash exposure to the euro to the point where they run it at the minimum. And this is producing some downward pressure on the currency. Uh, and to my mind, it's not a very good sign. Usually what you would get is you would get some treasurers uh, who begin to think, well, the euro has fallen enough now under current circumstances. Um, we've got a bit of a profit on the book because we shorted it against the dollar at 130. So uh, we'll buy some back at 122 or whatever. I don't think there is that sort of uh, closing type business going on. It's the sort of business where um, you assume that there is going to be continuing business despite what your treasury, uh, your day-to-day -day treasury operations um, reflect. Uh, and I think, I, th I think there are, I mean, the major corporations who are really getting worried about uh, their exposure to, to uh, the Eurozone, and they are reducing their positions. I think it is as simple as that. Yeah, so we've got a collapsing, imploding monetary system around the world. The U.S. dollar just appears to be stable because everything else is so unstable. And in its exalted position as the reserve currency, it has that reputation for stability, even though it's not really deserved, you know, based on the uh, shepherding of the currency by the Federal Reserve since 1913. It's certainly not not deserved. And yet, it's everything else looks so sick. You're going to put it into the yuan, the renminbi, which is not convertible anyway, and which nobody trusts, or 
are you going to put it into the dollar, which I guess is what we've seen a lot of, that panic, uh, you know, flight for safety. And, you know, you got all these currency units and you can't just go buy gold with all of them. So you have to put them someplace and the dollar, you know, the, uh, the best looking horse in the glue factory, as it were. Yes, uh, I don't think we're 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 sort of quite at that point even yet, Kerry. I think uh, uh, if I can go back to the example of company treasurers, uh, they probably account in dollars. Um, so their idea of safety is basically get rid of uh, get rid of euros and just bring it back into dollars, uh, and that is as far as they think. Uh, that is how they're taxed. That is how they account, and so on and so forth. So, the natural. Uh, if you like, reaction to a paper currency uh, getting into what could be terminal difficulties is to just shift it into another paper currency. Um, and I don't think, I don't think uh, you're going to see companies uh, doing very much on the gold and silver front as an alternative to paper currencies. They just don't think like that. On the other hand, what is interesting is what the banks are doing because um, uh, the Basel III changes that are coming through and it's even got as far as America uh, where it's out for con consultation is to include gold as a tier one asset when it comes to calculating haircuts and so on and so forth. Uh, in ranking exactly the same as cash, by the way, and short-term short -term government debt. So the banks now have an alternative, or at least they will have an alternative from next year, uh, of uh, holding fiat currencies and being entirely committed, if you like, to the systemic risks uh, that go with that. They now they will have the alternative of um, having gold without being penalized. Now, that, I think, is a very interesting development, a very important one, uh, one that has been reported by some people. I've written on it and so on and so forth. But generally, it is uh, a development which people, I don't think, really understand the implications uh, of uh, so far. That could be a very, very important thing. So we're on the cusp, the cusp, if you will, of a lot of potentially, I don't want to say cataclysmic, but certainly a lot of decisions that are going to have to be made very quickly by politicians of limited intellectual capacity and limited freedom because they serve the elite, their elitist masters. And they're going to have to make these decisions really quickly if they haven't already been made for them already. And what are the odds that they're going to get all this right and that this edifice that has been cobbled together with, uh, you know, chewing gum and, uh, and paper clips and bits of paper, what are the odds it's going to remain standing after, after that final black swan descends? Well, I think it's long odds against. It has to be. Um, uh, I'm... I think I, I have a little more respect for the politician's intellect than <laughs> than you have, <laughs> Kerry. Um, I mean, the the reality of the situation is that uh, any politician today has inherited a situation uh, which he has to operate, you know, the boundaries of which he has to operate within, and. Um, all his economic advice, uh, you know, you get people with PhDs out of the top universities, uh, they're all Keynesian, um, and he has to listen to them. Uh, and furthermore, uh, he is elected by electorates, by pressure groups who basically want him to spend someone else's money. That is the reality of every democracy we have now. And uh, the politician is actually hemmed in in this. There's not a lot he can do. Um, there is, I think, I, I was hoping there might be one possibility of getting out of this problem. And that is that uh, if the euro collapses, as I think looks increasingly likely, uh, the central bankers will, for covering the dollar, covering sterling and, um, you know, the yen and so on and so forth, might take this as a wake-up call and think, no, hold on a minute – we are destroying our currencies. There is a significant problem that we're going to wipe out our paper currencies if we continue as we are. We therefore have no alternative but to stop printing money and uh, let the over-indebted 
businesses and governments fall as a result because the alternative is far, far worse. There is an outside possibility, therefore, that the collapse of the euro might actually persuade uh, the governors of the other central banks that uh, there is a huge risk that they will destroy their currencies by pursuing current policies. Um, whether they will prevail or not, I think, is still very much odds against. But I think that is our only hope. Um, just imagine, just imagine in America, um, if, let us say, the whole of government spending has to come to a shuddering halt because uh, the Fed refuses to buy any more government debt. Um, you know, it's it's a very, very big ask of one's imagination. You know, even if you're an Austrian economist, to really see that coming about. And that, I think, is the big difficulty about uh, looking into the future. And that's the big difficulty, trying to sort of um, see some way in which the politicians could possibly avoid uh, an almost terminal monetary uh, crisis. I don't know, Alistair, you're beginning to sound like an optimist to me. I'm kind of take uh, Dr. Johnson's view of uh, politicians and their ability to cope. Uh, going back to Dr. Johnson's view on second marriages, the triumph of hope over experience. Over experience, yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you can't emphasize that one enough, you know, because this is what we're up against, competing interests and... And the alternative, when you crash out this economy uh, because you refuse to stop printing, refuse to continue printing, rather, um, I don't know any politicians that really has the guts to take that on. But I guess we're going to find out, aren't we? Uh, I think it's going to be a test, yes. Um, I agree with you. I can't think of any of the politicians around today who would have the guts to take it on. Uh, and I can think maybe that uh, the central bankers uh, will get very worried about the situation and think that there is only one way in which the currency can be saved. I think some of them will come to that conclusion. And remember that they do all meet regularly uh, at the Bank of International Settlements uh, right. by telephone, if not, <laughs> if, yes. if not actually in any other way. So, so um, they do swap notes, as it were. Um, but whether they can be truly independent of their governments in the sense that they will deny their governments money uh, now that is a very, very interesting one. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we're going to find out whether we want to or not as our nightmare continues unfolding. So, Alistair, obviously, we can find you at goldmoney.com. You also have a blog, uh, financeandeconomics.org. I don't know how much you've been uh, doing there because it sounds like you're amazingly uh, busy over at Gold Money. But, uh, hey, a lot of good things there. And everybody needs to be aware because the warning signs here are unmistakable. When you start seeing gold just go up and pretty much nothing stopping it, no resistance, and then you see silver, it's up 91 cents at the ounce today, you know that something's going on here. Yes, exactly. But uh, to, it's, just, it's just very unfortunate as far as the authorities are concerned, if I can use that. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of blanket term, <laughs> that the, the technical situation in the gold and silver market has become really quite unstable. Um, I mean, I, I've been looking at this uh, for some time, and <clears throat> silver and gold actually have been behaving differently insofar as the open interest in gold has been declining for the last two years from around about 650,000 contracts down to recently under 400,000, though on this rise it, is, it looks as if it's ticking up a little bit. Um, and uh, if you look at the, uh, the commercials, as it were, who are basically the swap dealers uh, and uh, the producers and merchants um, and processors, um, the swap boys have basically maintained uh, um, an even book for about the last six or eight months, whereas the people who have been short, uh, the producers, merchants, and so on, they have reduced their short position somewhat. But it's not going to take very much demand from money managers and so on and so forth, uh, whose ho net holdings are at historical lows, by the way, uh, 
It's not going to take much of a build-up in demand from that side, a few people following, following Paulson and Soros maybe, uh, to really test the producers and merchants, um, you know, that, that uh, net figure. And there, I think I'm right in saying that at the moment, uh, the um, producers bit, they are short uh, of around about 200,000 contracts, which is a heck of a lot of gold. It's, it's 640 odd tons, which if you look at the free world's production, um, is roughly about a third of it. They, they can't actually go much more short than that. So th the whole um, situation in gold is looking pretty dynamic and uh, explosive, and silver even more so. I mean, <clears throat> what's been happening there is that the open interest has been building uh, for about the last 10 months, and uh, it's just been sort of gradually ticking up. Um, and it's really a situation of no stock. There's just been no stock available there at all. Uh, and these shortages in the market, I think, are creating what looks like a bear squeeze. And uh, this, I think, helps explain why silver has moved up from what sort of recent lows of around about 27 and a bit. Yeah. Uh, and as we talk, we're um, sort of almost knocking on the door of 31. Yeah, and it, so it's a, it, yes, it's a very dynamic, very explosive situation potentially, and so for the manipulators, um, it's actually going to be quite difficult to control. Oh yes, it will. Um, it it shot through thirty dollars like uh, Charlie Sheen checking out a rehab. You know, <laughs> it just blew through it like it wasn't even there, and that's so yep. interesting about resistance points because once the market changes direction resistance become become the floor and just, it's, become support. Yeah, and exactly. <laughs> and they're just sort of you know, sort of historical oddities, but of no relevance actually to what's going on. Um, yeah, exactly. I agree with you. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah, I mean the, the the days of containment, as it were, uh in these markets, I think look over. Yep. And uh, we'll get into manipulation at another point, but honestly, I think uh, the whole meme of gold suppression precious metal suppression is it's just going to become irrelevant because once it gets to that uh, to its nominal high of 1920 and it breaks that and gold breaks the $50 mark we're not going to be having these discussions anymore it'll kind of be like we'll reminisce about it and say remember way back when when the federal reserve tried to keep the price of gold and silver down to make fiat currencies look like they actually had value it'll be like you'll tell your grandchildren this story and they won't believe it because it's just going to be meaningless but right now it dominates the attention but we all know this day is coming and alistair on that note uh, uh we've done a bunch of interviews they're all up on financial survival network.com go there we got james turk interviews there mark faber I just interviewed uh, Gerald Salente yesterday, so we're optimists compared to Gerald, I'll tell you that. And <laughs> yes, I know. I interviewed him in New York, but, uh, oh, it must be nearly a year ago now. And um, I mean, even then, he was, he was absolutely adamant about um, the way society was breaking down. And uh, we've certainly seen that. He's been dead right, um, particularly with respect to the Arab Spring and all the rest of it. Yeah, and that, um, is, that is disturbing, the... The decline of Western culture, forget about everything else, but just our culture, the yeah. way it's become this parasitic, uh, just this unhealthy, but hey, I don't want to get into it. I don't want to bum out the listeners. We'll talk about that another time too. Alistair, hey, Absolutely. thanks thanks for being on and thanks for giving us some insight because the news is going to break from Europe and head across the Atlantic. I'm convinced of that. Whatever is going to happen it's happening uh, with you guys first. So yeah. on that note, Alistair, hey, we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. You be well, and thanks again. Well, thank you, Kerry. Um, it's nice talking to you again, and uh, we'll keep in touch on it. <laughs>